NRDC has long considered nuclear war among its many attributes a profound environmental problem. Nuclear war would threaten the natural environment on which all life depends. Um, nuclear weapons, like chemical weapons or biological weapons, have unique characteristics. A nuclear explosion generates enormously high temperatures, uh, very different from a conventional explosion, and generates radiation. In fact, there are five main effects of a nuclear explosion. Blast, a crushing overpressure, and greater than hurricane force winds. Intense thermal radiation, heat radiation, that can create fires out to very far distances from the ground zero. An initial pulse of radiation, different from fallout, an initial pulse of neutrons and gamma rays um, that uh, is a result of the immediate nuclear reactions within a minute after the uh, explosion occurs. The electromagnetic pulse, which as we've maybe seen in some um, popular media, can disable electronics out to a very wide distance, uh, further compromising the ability of uh, first responders to, um, to deal with the catastrophe. And fallout. Fallout occurs when a nuclear explosion is close enough to the surface of the Earth that material from the Earth is vaporized and mixed with the debris from the nuclear explosion and falls out within 10, 20, 100 kilometers of the ground zero. At Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the explosion occurred 500 meters above the surface of the Earth. The fireball didn't touch the Earth. There was that initial pulse of radiation that produced it casualties that produce death, but there was not that, that fallout. Fallout occurred, of course, during the a period of above-ground nuclear testing. Fallout is of profound importance when considering the, the nuclear, targeting nuclear strategies that could be a part of um, a nuclear war uh, that could have, that could have These issues of targeting and nuclear war planning we'll discuss at our event later today. As a, uh, a scientist working in an uh, NGO on environmental issues, I have profound concerns about the, the direction of the United States government uh, since, since the last election, where that touches on nuclear weapons issues. And I, I think it's very important and inspiring for me personally to be here at the UN today talking about nuclear weapons issues, where, where I have concerns about the US government are, are really in three areas. Um, one, how will the new U.S. administration handle, uh, manage the U.S. nuclear arsenal and, and the government, our government, U.S. government's important capacities for um, nuclear arms control and non-proliferation work? How will this government uh, manage a, a nuclear crisis in the next four years? What is the likelihood that there could be nuclear weapons used somewhere in the world in the next four years? Can the U.S. effectively reduce that risk, moderate that crisis. Where will the U.S. nuclear modernization program go? Will it be accelerated? Hans mentioned this, this issue. Right now, um, Russia and the U.S. are both modernizing their nuclear arsenals, their Cold War arsenals. And in essence, it's a project that could mean we have these nuclear arsenals, or it's intended to, to um, to, the end result is that we have these nuclear arsenals for generations uh, to follow. Uh, that's not a future that um, uh, you know that is, uh, is is the best future. In fact, one concern I have about the U.S. administration is uh, the danger that um, the policy goal may not be zero nuclear weapons. It may be a long-term goal uh, for nuclear weapons in U.S. policy. That too would be a mistake. A second category of worries I have are with our arms control with Russia, um, uh, some of the bedrock of, of strategic nuclear arms control, strategic stability between the U.S. and Russia are in doubt. Um, uh, the New START Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Um, uh, these treaties are not only uh, about limiting nuclear weapons, but they're about providing predictable behaviors and communications between the two countries that have over 90% of the, of the <coughs> world's arsenals today. Finally, I have concerns uh, about uh, uh, 
about the role of nuclear weapons in a crisis in, in the Middle East uh, and in Asia. And, um, and uh, we may see uh, um, nuclear weapons uh, play a role in these crises. It's a very grave danger. It's a danger that, that uh, the international community uh, uh, will need to focus on more and more in the years ahead. Thank you. <coughs> nuclear weapons were conceived as weapons of coercion and terror. Uh, in fact, a descendant of air warfare, which was also conceived by its um, or organizers or inventors as warfare of terror. So um, Henry Stimson, when he briefed President Truman after he assumed office in 1945, said this to him, if the problem of the proper use of this weapon can be solved, we would have the opportunity to bring the world into a pattern in which the peace of the world and our civilization can be saved. So this is a kind of a coercive idea. We will use nuclear weapons to bring the world into a pattern that we want. Of course, that was a time when the US uh, would have the monopoly of nuclear weapons, it was just before the first nuclear test. Churchill said this in the 50s, I think. Safety will be the sturdy child of terror and survival the twin brother of annihilation. This is not a very safe way to run the world. In fact, uh, we came within one person's sanity and sobriety of blowing the whole world up in 1962 when uh, Vasily, Vasily Archipov um, on, a, on a Soviet submarine voted against using a nuclear torpedo during the Cuban Missile Crisis and he had the authority to stop two voted for it and one against. Uh, for, for the whole period, um, the United States certainly and other countries, Pakistan for instance, um, Russia maybe in some circumstances, have reserved the right to use nuclear weapons first in any conflict. Uh, that also applies to NATO, it was affirmed in 1999 um, when NATO had its 50th anniversary uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, nuclear threats have been used and nuclear forces have been alerted in a variety of situations. Of course, they were contemplated for use in Korea and Viet Vietnam, not used, fortunately, since Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the way of actual explosions, but in the way, as Daniel Ellsberg had said, um, of uh, somebody during a holdup that has a gun but actually doesn't fire it. Uh, Nuclear forces were put on alert in 1954, just before the coup in Guatemala. Uh, they've been put on alert in relation to oil crises in 1973, in 1979, 1980. Um, so there had been one exception in the late 1960s when the anti-ballistic missile treaty was negotiated. And the idea behind that treaty, since both the uh, U.S. and the Soviet Union had warheads that could um, be used for a first strike, multiple independently targeted, many, many warheads on a single missile, very difficult to counter, and anti-ballistic missile weapons that could shoot down nuclear weapons were being developed by both sides. And they were developed with the idea that if you go first, then the remaining weapons could maybe be shot down. You could protect yourself and have fewer casualties than your nuclear adversary. This was a US-Soviet thinking game. And the anti-ballistic missile treaty came out of that. And so it really served as an instrument against this first use, first strike thinking um, until it was renounced by the United States in 2002. In my opinion, a lot of the tensions originate in that renunciation because the security between the United States and Russia that the other side won't be able to um, do a first strike successfully and protect itself as much as without these anti-ballistic missile systems. That dis system has been disturbed. And now it comes in the context, now we have a much more complex context than a nuclear monopoly or a nuclear geopoly, US, Russia, or even the US. Russia and China, of course France and uh, UK being on the side of the US. In the 90s and 2000s, 
nuclear weapons migrated from there to a small dictatorship of a small impoverished country, North Korea, uh, India and Pakistan, of course Israel, and also to some extent to the caves of Afghanistan where Osama bin Laden started issuing threats. He didn't have the materials, he didn't have the weapons, but certainly he had the concept. And so here we are in this situation where nuclear weapons being the monopoly of the most wealthy, sophisticated, technologically advanced country in the world in 1945, now has become an instrument that is much more general. Um, and so I think this treaty that is being negotiated here from a humanitarian point of view is extremely important, not, not only because of its aims, but because it takes the right view to nuclear weapons. Safety in a nuclear weapons arena, uh, era cannot be the child of terror, sturdy child of terror. It is not a sturdy child. And we cannot have annihilation as the twin brother of, of security. That is the world in which we live now, and we are descending into greater peril. And I hope that the humanitarian side of nuclear weapons, and I'm going to elaborate on that more this afternoon to give you examples of how nuclear weapon states have harmed their own people, first of all. Every nuclear weapon state has, first of all, harmed its own people in the course of making and testing nuclear weapons. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mary Olson. And I have to say that I find what is happening here, the world gathering, is creating a sturdy seedling of hope. And we must all undertake its care. Because we've heard about all of this darkness. And this new effort is under humanitarian law. This is a tectonic shift. Nuclear has been under military law. And it will remain there. This doesn't revoke the NPT, but it's the humanitarian side. And the first treaty of this kind is the Landmine Treaty, which is the most successful treaty in the history of treaties. It is a template for the work that is shifting now nuclear into the humanitarian scope. And I have to tell you that the template includes impact on non-combatants, impacts on our entire human life cycle, impacts on farmers and through time. And so the work that I have contributed to, others as well, on gender and radiation are part of making that case. And you'll find it in the second point of the preamble. But I want to just for a moment tell you that we have 70 years of data from the horrific event of dropping nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. My government did that. I always apologize as one woman. I wish it had never happened. But it has created an enormous data set of survivors. And we have 70 years of data from that group. And it is really the only large group that includes both genders and all ages. And so my little contribution to this work has been a disaggregation based on gender and not looking at dose. Normally you see curves of data on radiation. It, we know it's harmful. That's why it's regulated. But it's regulated for adult males only. And that turns out that adult males are 10 times more resistant to radiation harm than if a female body is exposed as a young child. And this is not childhood cancer so that I'm referring to that that female suffers. It's across her entire lifespan. So our entire global population has been impacted by radiation day in and day out. And our current regime estimating the consequences of that exposure are very far off the mark of what's actually happening because they're only looking at the impact to adult males. Now, I have brought some pictures. The one on the upper right is the graph that shows a constant dose. But the age of exposure, the age the individual was in 1945 in Hiroshima or Nagasaki when they survived and then joined the study. And uh, the long-term consequences were tracked over 70 years. And the left end is the people who were exposed as children. And you'll notice that boys also get a lot more health effects and consequences than men. So the reference man does not even rep represent the male part of our species correctly. And we're way off. So part of turning the scope 
of our concern about nuclear weapons must include what has already happened from the mining, from the processing, from the fabrication of the weapons, and perhaps most of all, from the use and testing of them. We have already impacted our, our planet without a full-scale war, and unfortunately, we are blind to most of what has been happening. Thank you. To be here before you uh, on behalf of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, the Global uh, Health Professionals Federation dedicated to ending the greatest threat to humanity. The World Health Organization, when it last considered the effects of nuclear war on health and health services, concluded that nuclear weapons pose the greatest immediate threat to human health and welfare. And the veracity of that conclusion stands. There has been a long history throughout uh, the nuclear age of denial of the evidence, willful denial of the evidence of the severity, the duration, the indiscriminate nature, the intergenerational impacts of these horrendous weapons. Evidence has not been collected deliberately. If it has been collected, it's been suppressed or its implications uh, silenced. One example is the focus through decades on blast as the predominant effect for estimating casualties, when in fact it's fires in urban areas that will ex extend to a much greater area than anybody would be. Uh, so those who survive blast will be encompassed in firestorms of 800 degrees Celsius and removal of all of the oxygen from the air that no living thing will survive over a much greater extent than they would be killed by blast. There's new data about radiation effects. Uh, all of the evidence that has emerged more recently suggests that what we understand about the consequences is worse than we previously thought. All of the evidence points in the direction it's worse than we used to think. And the area in which that is most in most relevant in this context, the most crucial new evidence that's accumulated over the past decade is the extraordinary climate impacts of even limited regional use in nuclear terms. A tiny fraction of the global nuclear arsenal, less than a half a percent of the world's nuclear weapons, less than a tenth of a percent of the yield, the explosive yield of the global nuclear arsenal, targeted on cities, would pr produce so much soot and smoke high in the atmosphere where it would persist for years, descend very slowly, and cool, darken, and dry the surface of the earth across the planet, decimating agriculture and putting at risk billions of people from starvation on a scale that humanity has never before witnessed. This is profound evidence. That is now confirmed by many groups of leading atmospheric scientists. And you'll have an opportunity next Tuesday in a side event that my colleagues, Dr. Ira Helfand and Dr. Alan Robock, one of the lead authors of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Reports, will discuss the latest evidence uh, of this. This is groundbreaking. This means that not just the Russian and American arsenals, but in fact, all of the nuclear arsenals in the world Include, except for that of North Korea, but India, China, Israel, Pakistan, uh, Britain and France, those arsenals pose an existential threat. And it emphasizes that the only safe and sustainable option is zero. The process leading up to these negotiations has seen an unprecedented collaboration uniting the main professional federations that link health professionals across the world. The World Medical Association, the International Council of Nurses, the World Federation of Public Health Associations, the largest health professional associations globally have joined with international physicians, like PNW, in calling for the banning and eliminating of nuclear weapons as an urgent global health imperative and these negotiations, which are starting now, is the most promising step to progress that that we've, that we've ever seen. This is unprecedented. And 
the governments of the world better take notice. When your GP, your specialist, your nurse, and your health department is telling you the same thing, uh, you should heed that advice. But it's not enough for us to present this evidence, which I'm delighted most of the governments of the world now understand has been confirmed and updated and not seriously challenged in any way uh, through those extraordinary humanitarian conferences. 68 years into the nuclear age it took before governments actually sat down to consider in a dedicated way the humanitarian impacts of the weapons that had been deployed already for decades. Um, that evidence was confirmed and agreed to and recognised and it forms the basis for the motivation of this important treaty. It's recognised prominently uh, in the preamble food security, health, intergenerational effects, disproportionate impacts on women and girls is there. But it's not enough for, for us as custodians of, of people's health um, to just present the evidence and expect uh, somehow things to happen. We also have a responsibility to ensure that that evidence is understood, that its implications are seen, and that they are acted on. And that's what's happening now. Um, and this is the really the most promising opportunity as a global community. This is bringing humanity, uh, the interests of global humanity and global democracy, uh, to nuclear weapons, which have been regarded as the fiefdom of those few states that claim a unique right uh, to possess these uh, weapons that pose an existential threat to all of us.